Good morning, Nancy. How you doing? <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear you. Hi there. Good morning, Donna. Okay. Printing up some pictures to possibly paint from today. Did you guys receive the email from me last evening? Yes. some plastic covers over the uh, references. So when I splatter them with paint. Good morning, Gail. <laughs> okay, sorry, Gail, can't hear you. Everyone forgets to turn their mic on. Yep, that's all right. Okay. I think I'm okay. Are we supposed to be on or off, Michael? Oh, it's fine to be on for now in the beginning here, and then I can mute everybody, and uh, okay, good. people can just... unmute themselves as they see fit. I'm just trying to figure out what painting I should do today for our demo. And so I've selected four possible. Two of them are little paintings that I did that I could do larger. And then two photo references. All 
right, I'm going to go ahead and try going between the different screens. Hi, Gail. Morning. Okay, everybody can see my Photoshop here now? Yep. Yes. Right, with rolling grass and dark trees? Yep. All right, maybe what I should do is bring in the possible pictures that I was thinking of painting, at least two of them. Ooh, pretty. Isn't that right. nice? Yeah, yeah, these are both areas within about a mile of my studio, so I'm pretty lucky. Oh my uh, what is the date today? Does anybody know? Oh, it is today, the 28th. Wow. 28th? Okay, that's what I was thinking. All right, and the camera. <laughs> All right, that's working. Everybody can still hear me okay from over here? Yeah. Yep. Great, and I think, I hope, I finally got my lighting figured out. Whoa. Yeah, I got special filters put on my lights. So now hopefully we'll be without the glare. Will the canvas be at an angle this morning? Maybe I need to turn up my computer. I'm having a hard time hearing you guys. Oh. All right. Hopefully every week I get a little better at this. Get things figured out. The whole lighting and glare was such an issue in the first six weeks. And I apologize to all the awesome students that <laughs> stuck with me, even though that was pretty tough. But hopefully now I've got a special filter on my camera and special filters put on all the lights and hopefully together. It should work out better. And do you guys know what the difference is between the pin and the spotlight for everyone, which one I should be choosing? I haven't a clue. The pin. The pin seems to be working. All right, pin it is, which makes me pretty big here. <laughs> what a messy studio back there. <laughs> Looks divine. Ah, thanks. You can see the little ones that I did as the demo for the Washington Art Group back there behind the lights. Um, big purple painting I've been working on yesterday. Oh, oh, that's pretty. Nice. There it is, all right. And then <clears throat> oh, I think I posted some of that on the class link there. And those are all kind of tonalist paintings actually, or luminist or whatever we want to call them. All right, we have one more minute. I'm going to run and get a freshened up coffee while we're letting the last group of people join us. And we will start in one or two minutes. Morning, sister. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Are you ready? I don't know. I don't either. <laughs> It's the only way we get to see each other. <laughs> All right, I'll talk to you later. I better All mute. Right. <laughs> no, I think he said we didn't have to yet. He said he can automatically mute us all when he needs us to be muted. Oh, okay. All right. I tried to unmute that sound. When I have it pinned, did it stay on me when you guys were talking? Stayed on my messy studio? Uh-huh. Okay, cool. Great. I don't know how many people are in here now because I can't see that many. Oh, okay. We got a good man. All right. 
Thank you all for joining us live. And uh, welcome to class two of Painting on the Edge. And Susan, sorry about your hand. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hopefully that's your left hand and you're right-handed. Yeah, right hand's good. Okay, good. Yeah, this hand, thank my you. left hand's but Thank you. No, no problem. Great. Well, again, good to see everybody and thank you. And uh, last week we dealt with um, edges and a, a number of you guys got out of your comfort zone. I know it was tough and did abstract paintings and I'm very proud of you. They were fantastic. I can even see some in the background there of your guys' scene. I don't know how to get on Facebook. Oh, you don't know how? No. Okay. Um, Susan, I'll help you. My sister helped me. We'll, we can do it. Well, I, I got on it, but then I tried this morning. I see, I, I hate Facebook, so I don't use it. <laughs> but I tried to get on it. Let's see, where is it down here? Let me see it. Well, we'll do it later. Okay, yeah, so the big thing is the link I sent you, or I think you can look up painting on the edge and it yes. should pop yes. up. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, I apologize because I know a lot of people um, are unhappy with Facebook these days and I get that completely. It's just the best way I've found to be able to share everything and uh, without, I mean, 90% of us already are on Facebook in some capacity. So it's the easiest and it's uh, pretty usable. And uh, so unfortunately it's what I'm going with, um, but I completely understand people not liking Facebook, especially after the last couple of years of political stuff and everything else going both ways um, and every which way. <laughs> um, but hopefully you can just avoid Facebook and just join our happy, political free, uh, friendly art site, uh, Painting on the Edge and uh, have a good time and ignore the rest. So you don't even have to think of it as Facebook, just think of it as our page, our group. Um, so this week we are gonna, well, every week of this class, we are gonna be continuing on with edges. And this week is about soft edges. So um, I know the I was posted a couple links to kind of what is tonalism and uh, references to tonalism. And tonalism really does cover a wide gamut of work. Uh, primarily, it's um, about a time frame about the 1880s to the 1920s of American art. Um, kind of based loosely on what the French called the Barbizon style, or uh, maybe in the US we would think of the um, kind of some of the New York painters, the uh, Hudson River School. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of, uh, ex kind of taking that and uh, making it their own. But the, there's, I, when I was looking it up, there's about 12 different aspects to a tonalist painting. And not all tonalist paintings have all 12 of the aspects. And I will post that um, link and that list. But I didn't want to post it before class because I thought it would be far too confusing. Because so many of the paintings that I love that are tonalist only have one or two of those 12 ingredients. So I don't want you, while you're doing this uh, week's assignment, to worry about is it tonalism or is it not? Like, am I following the rules exactly? Here are the two things I want you to worry about and think about when you're doing your painting. I want a limited color palette. Okay. Um, and I'll describe that a little bit when we get over to the palette. Um, and I want a lot of soft edges with big shapes. Meaning we're not worrying too much about detail. I don't want to see a whole lot of leaves and individual grasses painted. We are looking for big shapes, soft edges, and a limited palette. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Of course, you're going to have some tight edges and you're going to have some other colors and you're going to have, you know, some detail. I don't care about that. But the main focus besides having fun and experimenting and playing is the soft edges. Remember, this class is about edge quality. So as we work up through our different assignments in these classes, we're going to be experimenting with different types of edge quality. All right. So hopefully that clarifies that. And I wanted to say it early in the class so people, you know, when they're tuning in at the beginning, um, will know what this is about and what I'm going to be looking for in your assignments and what I want you to be looking for when you are contemplating which references or what picture, and you can completely make it up out of your head if you want to. Um, and you are welcome to do the paint at home game. If you literally wanna paint, like just rewatch this and paint along with me and somewhat replicate what I'm doing. I know for some people that's a little bit easier, at least with the first time doing a certain style of painting. Um, I welcome that but it's not highly encouraged. I also want you to feel free to paint whatever you want. I will be painting some scene with trees, soft atmosphere, and um, probably some interesting light. So that being said, I'm gonna actually have you guys vote on which one I should paint. So I pulled up four different references. Two of them are photos. Um, from right near my house. In fact, just opposite directions, about a mile away from my house. So the first one here is a bird sanctuary. You take this trail, up this trail, go through there. And right on the other side is the Tualatin Hills Bird Refuge, right along Highway 99 in the Tiger Tualatin area. Um, beautiful. Uh, anyways, this is one scene, just kind of a field, some trees, some foggy landscape in the back with some nice light going the opposite direction from my studio, and I may have to take the plastic off here so it's not too shiny. I have Beaverton Creek, the namesake of my hometown here of Beaverton. And uh, there's a little wetlands protected area um, also for birds. And the last couple of years it got dammed up by beavers and they changed this little marshy area into almost a big, huge, gigantic pond and uh, it's much more beautiful and much less stinky. <laughs> um, but that is now filling up with uh, silt slowly. And it's interesting watching all the irises that are gonna be blooming there soon. But anyways, this is sunrise over there. I'm trying to hold it straight. Um, I got some grasses here in the foreground and some big trees. Might have to change the shapes a little bit. I'm noticing a strange balance here and here and uh, some things, but anyways, that's scene number two. The other ones are out of my head and they're based on little paintings that I did. And this is something that I've been doing more and more while well, I'll do my painting once small. And then if I like it, great. Uh, let me just turn that light down, there we go. So this is just kind of loosely based on, why is it so hard to hold it straight to the camera? Um, uh, kind of the fields near my home, uh, kind of across from where the bird, the first picture I showed you, some nice big clouds, some just made up trees. Um, and scene number four, which is maybe one of the most difficult to see and really shiny, is very much just a tonalist painting. It's almost all purples and just more about values. And then, uh, what was it, yesterday, two days ago, I just came in and added some purple flowers on top just to try to make it a little more interesting. So if you can remember one, two, three, four, um, I will let you guys pick which one and I will be doing it on an 18 inch by 24 inch panel. Um, and again, you guys are welcome to paint along. And if you want um, one of the other references that maybe we don't pick, let me know and I can post them to our page if you would rather paint from one of those. So if you guys don't mind holding up your fingers, one finger, two fingers, three fingers, or four. All right, I'm seeing a lot of number threes. Number one, two, one, three, four. 
But he got Peggy. Uh-oh, Peggy's going against the... Oh, boy. Okay, who can count really fast? I'm thinking it looks like three to me. One, okay. three, four threes. Lorianne, do you have a, a bit of vote three? All right, I think it's three. So I believe that was clouds, which kind of gives us a little bit of everything. So that one's good. Lots of nice and soft and lost edges. Um, so I think that'll be a fun one. So good choice, everybody. And yeah, <clears throat> I won't worry about making it exactly like this because this was a very fast, fun little painting. Um, and we'll just play with it from there. So, all right. Michael, could I ask a real quick question? Um, what is the smallest size you, that we should be working in? Like, I'm just However wondering. you want, truthfully. If you, like, remember even, like, how I did the abstract last week? If you wanted to do, like, four little four-inch by five-inch paintings or something like that, that's fine. Um, I find that if I work much smaller than this, like, this is a nine by 12, so yeah. eight by 10 is generally as small as I get for most of my paintings. Okay. Um, especially when you're dealing with big shapes and big brushwork and we'll mm -hmm. deal with edges. I know a lot of teachers will suggest just tons and tons of little tiny paintings, which I completely understand. But I find for me and a lot of my students that when you actually get to a certain smallness that we tighten back up. Yeah. Um, sometimes, and again, if we want to learn to be painting with our arm and opposed to just our little, you know, our fingertips, having a, some space to move around is nice. Mm -hmm. So whatever's comfortable for you, truthfully, whatever you have laying around, <laughs> truthfully. Um, I know we just got um, a new bed delivered and I just cut up a whole bunch of the cardboard into usable pieces that I'll be gessoing. Um, with a couple coats of gesso just to play with and you know anything that I don't care too much about or maybe you're like solely and Carrie and you're gonna paint something beautiful every time and you want to keep it and make sure that you you know have it on something nice that's not gonna deteriorate in the next couple of weeks um, so that's up to you but if you just want to experiment and play and you're not sure paint on anything you want paper cardboard um, cheap panels but if you think, you know what, this one's cool, I'm excited, I'm going to spend some time, then maybe grab a little, something a little bigger, a little nicer, and uh, yeah, whatever you like, truthfully. These, all of these exercises are for you. You guys already all have A's in this class, so congratulations. And <laughs> <laughs> all I ask is that you keep playing and trying new things, being brave, and uh yeah, being willing to experiment. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and change my view back to speaker view and let's go to the share screen and quickly pop over to our Facebook page just to check in. All right, everybody seeing the Facebook page now? Yes. All right, fantastic. So I'm not going to spend um, class time really going through and critiquing too much. Sometimes I may pick one or two paintings to kind of look through, but um, I did want to just show you guys, if you hadn't had a chance to um, plug in, look at all the cool and interesting things everybody's sharing, you know, there's some truly abstract, abstract work. There's some much more representational. Um, it, it, it's really neat to see what you guys are doing. And again, I do what you like, what you enjoy, as long as you are experimenting with the assignment, I guess, you know, just trying to push yourself a little bit you know, because this is very representational, you know, um, nice job, Kathleen, but at the same time, it really reflects the different types of edge quality, mm -hmm. and it really is a great reference for, you know, how do they represent themselves, and how do they um, convey different emotions and different feeling, so very nice. It's fun to see even a combination of more representational to the completely abstract and lost edges. And I can see some 
fun marks being made by Susan there with, uh, I'm not sure what kind of, some kind of a scratching tool or something. Um, anyways, you guys, great work. Also, thank you, uh, Karen, for sharing this fun picture. Yeah, that cat's holding the brush the right way. I love that. Um, <laughs> and uh, Kathleen, again, um, it's fun when you guys share things that you're kind of coming across that have to do with the assignment. I mean, this painting is a perfect example of every type of edge quality in here. You got the super crisp, super sharp to the kind of soft edge to the completely lost edge back in the sky. Um, really nice. And then let's pop over really quick to some of the examples. So in the albums, I've been kind of splitting them up. So we've got the art references from last week's class, just different types of edge quality, classroom exercises and homework. That's just kind of where I'm posting my examples. Um, reference photos, you're more than welcome, even for today's assignment, to see if any of these pictures strike your fancy and you think might work um, for today's assignment. And tonalism. I'm sorry that every one of these uh, posted individually onto our page. I know that was probably annoying for a lot of people to have 21 pictures pop up all of a sudden on their Facebook from me. Um, what I found out is I need to title them while I'm loading them. If I go back in and put the title into the comments, all of a sudden they all pop up. So if for about an hour or two, uh, Facebook was completely <laughs> tonalist pictures being posted by me, I apologize. Let me take a quick drink here. I'm gonna quickly run through uh, some of these that I posted. There are so many beautiful, beautiful tonalist paintings. I urge you to go out and look for some, maybe post a couple to the group. If you find some that you really like and think are uh, interesting to share. But why I grabbed these where there's some uh, traditional and some modern um, tonalist paintings, and also very different styles of tonalism. This is a good friend of mine, Don Bishop. If you guys remember back to a story I told you about where he challenged me to um, just work on design for one entire summer, doing like three small design-based, value-based paintings. Um, this is the gentleman. He uh, lives pretty close to me. We paint together quite often, show together quite often. We show in a, two different galleries together. Um, and he, I would say mostly does tonalism, but different types. And some of his paintings actually get really, really bright. But he is very much into simplifying the landscape. It's really interesting when I go out painting with him, um, just watching his editing process as he just simplifies down, simplifies down, simplifies down to the most important elements of it. And it's usually design-based. So Don Bishop, living artist. Here's uh, some of his new stuff that he's doing. They're very, very atmospheric, um, almost borderline abstract. And he actually is doing quite a bit of abstract work um, lately. I find them very beautiful, very meditational. Um, people do kind of mistake our work for each other's work sometimes. And I completely understand that. Um, but anyways, really beautiful, very subtle. Another thing I wanted to show you between these two is something, again, if I can keep referencing music, is low key and high key paintings. So a low key painting, if you think of the piano, would be the bomb, bomb, bomb the very heavy kind of dark notes on the piano. The high key is the tinkling, you know, high pitched sounds on the left side of the piano. I believe I'm right on which side goes which way on the piano. Um, and so this is kind of a low key painting, meaning the darks, or actually you could even say it's, a, it's got a full range between the darks all the way to the lights. This painting on the other hand is very high key. So if you think of a value scale going from white to black, you know, with 10 layer levels in between, this painting probably only goes from one being white to three 
as far as as dark as it gets. Maybe there's a couple little spots in there that get a touch darker, but there's definitely, if you look to the edge with the black over here on the edge of the image, you can really see that there's nothing like that. So I urge you to play with that. Maybe some of you are going to be more interested in low key, darker, more, um, you know, melancholy or more evening dusk kind of paintings. Some of you may be high key where it's more about fog and atmosphere or a blinding sense of light. Um, so I urge you to think about that. And just because your reference that you're looking at maybe a low key does not mean you have to stay there. It's up to you. When you pick your colors, you can also pick your values. Okay, that's part of our artistic license is we get to change anything and everything. And I urge you to contemplate that just like Don does. I'm sure there is a road and dirt and different types of grasses and random trees. And you know what I mean? He doesn't go until he finds the perfect, beautiful, clean field and laid out trees. He just makes it up, but he's, he does paint most of his paintings plain air, if you can believe it. Um, he just really changes things as he's painting them. So I urge you to think about all of the elements of your painting. Is it useful? Can it be moved? Should it be moved? Should it be taken out? Should it be lightened? Should it be darkened? Should I change the colors? You are the boss big boss of your painting. Use multiple references if you want. Bring in elements from other pictures. All right, this is uh, Dwight, but uh, William Tryon. I'm not sure if I'm saying his name correctly at all, but I love this guy's work. Um, I think as you kind of roll through some of these tonalist paintings, you're gonna go, yeah, I am seeing why Mike likes this work, how it's influenced my painting sensibilities. Um, I wouldn't say I'm a tonalist, but I do get thrown into the tonalist um, category quite a bit. In fact, I've shown with the Tonalist Society of America and different things like that. Um, and I just love moody atmospheric pictures that kind of tell a story through their use of light, color, edge, atmosphere, all that temperature. Um, so here we can see that he does have a couple crisp edges that kind of lead the eye in and through, but he's really softening up. Are you guys able to see the mouse on there mm -hmm. moving around? Okay, mm -hmm. really soft and lost edges and corners. You know, these clouds are interesting, but if you squint your eyes, they almost disappear where this cloud definitely stays in focus. That's a great test for edge quality is squinting our eyes and seeing where do things just kind of disappear? So over here, this whole area just kind of disappears when you squint your eyes, but where these edges really come into focus. So he's taking us back there slowly. Our reward is these kind of nice little spot of clouds. Um, another one of paintings by Tryon, um, Dwight Tryon, Dwight, I guess. Um, I'm not sure if it's Dwight or Dwight. It looks like I wrote Dwight, but that may be a spelling error. Um, this one is very monochromatic, meaning one color almost. Even the sky is almost greenish. So I urge you to think kind of monochromatically, not completely. You're welcome to use, you know, some color in there. But and he does have some oranges to, you know, break it up some kind of sepias and uh, yellow <laughs> in there, a little bit of warmth, pinks. But if you were to say in one, one color, what is this painting? You'd probably say green, right? So overarching color, green. Okay, so write this guy in all capital letters. This is the, uh, one artist. I think that's me. Can everybody kill their, uh, mute their microphone? Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't get it to decline. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, if you guys don't mind muting and then we can just unmute when you want. And again, pressing the space bar is a great way to unmute. You just hold it down while you're talking. Um, so anyways, I was saying in all caps, write down the name George Innes, I-N-N-E-S-S. All you have to do to sound smart when anybody brings up tonalism is to say George Innes. He is the American superstar of tonalism. 
he's the one that gets referenced the most and uh, he's quite amazing. He's, you know, if I was gonna say, I want you guys to look at maybe study one artist, it would be George Ennis. Um, Portland Art Museum actually has a couple of his paintings and his work, he was really into um, spirituality and also the writing of George, or what's his name, Thoreau, um, and a couple other people. And he, his paintings really took on a symbolic meaning that I unfortunately have not studied enough to um, be able to tell you a lot about it. But I really do feel kind of a spirituality to his paintings. And I think, you know, it can be interpreted however you want it, but um, there's kind of a mystical, be soft beauty to his work that I really adore. And I really like how his paintings are really nice, but they're not labored. It, here's another thing that you can write down, kind of keep in your thoughts as you're working on this week's progress, is something called implied detail, right? Anybody doubt that these trees have leaves on them? Or even these trees have leaves on them? Or that this field is filled with grasses and shrubs? He's letting our brains put in that detail and that information. He doesn't need to come through and tell us grass, 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 leaf, 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 leaf. He needs to fill it in. And then he's got these little bits of edge quality breaking up the darker green tree to this lighter, warmer, yellowy, orange tree and just that little bit of edge quality even though it's not overly pronounced it's not overly clear it's just implied look at these trunks back here they're not perfectly drawn trunks but we still know that there's trunks they've got a couple of sky holes a little ground holes i guess you'd call them because you know we see the ground from behind there in it this if anybody's curious about a master's copy that maybe they do for this assignment this might be a great one um, because it's not too difficult. It's got lots of different types of brush quality, lots of brush sizes, a lot of fun, and you can do a lot of experimenting with it. It is a strange design, right? Look at how it's lit right down the middle, mm. almost in four quadrants. This isn't quite 50-50 where the horizon line is, but it's darn close. The 50-50 line would be right here. So it's a strange design. George Innes was self-taught. So a lot of his paintings as an art instructor, I kind of go, oh, George, I would have to, you know, point that out to you in front of the class. But uh, he kind of gets away with it. And so it's kind of like know the rules so you can forget the rules or just never know the rules So that in George's case. Um, let's see, a couple more. So yeah, these paintings like this are ones that really influenced me early on. They're almost just silhouettes. Um, I, when I'm kind of rewarding myself for a day of painting something that I don't want to paint, maybe a big commission of a subject I'm not really excited by, or I'm getting to the end of a show and I'm painting my 20th vineyard painting and kind of getting burnt out, I will reward myself with little quick paintings, kind of like the ones I just showed you that I'm going to use as a reference. And a lot of times they are these, right? I just kind of look for designs. I, I will look through my photos and say, you know what? The foreground information is busy and the midground information is busy, but what if I just made a really high contrast black and white photo of it? Oh, cool, and now it's got this interesting silhouetted design. So that's another thing I do a lot of times is I'll just take my reference photos into Photoshop and just push the contrast super high so I just lose tons of the information. I lose a lot of the um, in-between values and it comes out like this. You can still see that there's, you know, there is variation between the ultra darks and the, you know, not quite as dark all the way to the light. But I don't know, I really like these. I find them very relaxing. They definitely have a traditional old world feel to them, but they're fun for me. So if anybody, is interested in doing something like this, I just might urge you to lose some of the edges a little more. And you can see in here, he did do a lot more leaf um, representation. They're a lot more individualistic. But if we look on these trees back here, that's just soft edge represents kind of the, where the trees become thinner towards the outside of the painting. Another George Innes. 
This one's very famous. You see this a lot in history books and different uh, art books, some of the Americas. Um, this one's just nice. I, I reference this one a lot, especially when I'm out painting the gorge or doing commissions on the gorge, just because I love the warm backlight. Typically things as they go recede back into space, get bluer, cooler and grayer and lighter. And when it's backlit like this with layers of atmosphere sitting back in there, what happens is that light that's coming towards us is passing through those transparent gossamer layers of atmosphere and it's picking up that warm light. And so that's how um, it's able to make that effect of warm backlight. Does that make sense? I know that can be confusing for a lot of people. Okay. Um, looks like I kept on the George Ennis. Um, and this is just a nice simple one, kind of not too unlike the painting I'll be doing actually today with just some trees, a horizon line and interesting sky. George Ennis often would put a solitary character. A lot of times they were even wore kind of a, like a monk's robe. Um, this guy is a little fisherman on a little flat skiff or something and going towards the um, reflecting uh, setting sun, I believe. Maybe it's a rising sun, but I think it's a setting sun. And so that just kind of brings the interest. Um, he does like to throw in a small human element, a house or a figure. A lot of times you'll have like a mother and a child. Um, and they just look very stoic. They look like they're just kind of in the environment, enjoying the environment, and they look very meditative. Um, Another George Ennis, there you go. See the solitary figure, a couple cows. Um, this is another one of his more famous ones. And this one is not backlit. That's actually the moon back there catching the sunlight hitting it. You can tell because the trees and everything are toplit. So the shadow is being cast from behind us, rolling across the field. So not all tonalist paintings are backlit like I tend to do. Um, he, he does do some front lit and he does have some side lit paintings. So anyways, you're welcome to look for any direction of light. Oh man, I really did a lot of George Ennis. This is one, another one of my favorites of his. This is one I refer to. Um, I'm always curious what's exactly going back here. If this is so far away that those are just smokestacks from early manufacturing or what, I don't know what's going on back here. But you can see a little figure, again, a little house, a little fire. He just throws in these little elements. This tree is just so beautiful to me. It's not just a generic tree. So if you can look for the character in your tree, what makes it not just a air, you know, a car freshener pine tree? What makes it just not a round blob of a, you know, a bush? You might have to make it up. You might have to push it a little bit. Um, and if you are throwing in trunks and stuff, I urge you to go from thicker to thinner. You may have to turn your brush to its edge, or if you do need to pull out a small thinner brush for the little delicate details, feel free to do that. If I could zoom in here, I would show you that on his more th thinner areas, he often gets a little bit lighter and warmer in color with his paint. Uh, sheesh. Another George Ennis, I'm going to start cruising through his. He's just got so much work. He painted so very many paintings. And uh, he's just such a good representative of American tonalism that I thought I'd throw him in. Um, this is an interesting one. Where's the light source, right? For, at first, I would think, oh, it's back here because this tree seems backlit. This bar is so bright. But in fact, his light is coming from the left side and rolling across this field. And it's kind of shooting in between here and blasting away at these trees, this little house. And again, look at this little kid or somebody maybe fishing. Maybe there's two figures here. i um, not sure if these are white birds or flowers or what he's got, but little bits of information that are kind of interesting. Help tell the story. Boy, another Georgianus. Really atmospheric, really moody. This one's almost haunted looking to me, but at the same time, really beautiful. A couple figures. Maybe this is a log. Maybe this is a figure. I'm not sure. It just it's just cool. I love that sense of depth back there. Um, 
I used these kind of techniques quite a lot where I really pushed back my atmosphere and just have very close values, but just enough separation so you can see the light coming through. Everybody seeing these okay? I apologize, it's kind of small. Here's, I didn't know that I could zoom in. That's as much as it's gonna let me, but yeah, I still can't tell if this, I think this is probably mom. Maybe that's some fisherman, it looks like a pole. Maybe somebody sitting on a rock or something back there. It's just enough information to kind of let you know people are there, but not so much information that I even know or care. I know these paintings aren't gonna be for everybody. That some of you are like, ah, oh, tonalism is so old fashioned and silly looking. Um, but it's a great way to practice our edge quality. I adore this painting. I gotta zoom out because it cut off the top. But this is the epitome for me of what's important, what's not important, and high key painting, right? We've all seen this kind of weather when we're out in the snow and it's still either snowing or really got that kind of crystalline fog atmosphere where it's almost blasted out. It's like somebody just took an eraser to the world. Um, really, really subtle, really interesting. Um, I have a couple different artists that have done similar paintings and I always am just in awe of people who are able to practice so much restraint and tell so much with so little. Um, I'm not brave enough yet. I haven't painted anything really like this, but uh, I do appreciate it. So that's um, an artist named Twachtman, T-W-A-C-H-T-M-A-N, John Henry Twachtman. All right, another living tonalist painter. This guy used to live in Seattle, uh, has moved, and I'm not exactly sure where, maybe Indiana or somewhere like this. He is definitely a tonalist, but he doesn't do what I'm gonna be asking you guys to do today, because if you look through, even where the values get really close, he still has a fairly crisp edge quality. So he's using close values to push back versus um, soft edges. Over here, there's some soft edges. Over here, some soft edges. So kind of along his uh, periphery, he softens edges some. I just love his colors. His name is Mark, M-A-R-C. And then I'm not exactly sure. I think it's Bonet. B-O-H-N-E, anybody know how to pronounce that, Bonet? Um, love his work. I, I've probably every couple months remember to go check in and let's see what Mark's been up to. Um, he's a quiet, un unassuming painter. You don't see him um, too often, but I just love following his website and seeing what he does. Um, just beautiful, beautiful earthy colors, very subdued. Here's another one of his. Um, yeah, this one does have some more of the soft edges, um, interesting design elements. I think he's kind of a, I think he spends so much time working on his designs. They're always so interesting. They're never like super generic. Um, you know, this is strange. Like I would have been very tempted to round out this creek, maybe not to edit out whatever this little divot is. Um, but he just went ahead and left it in and makes it work by having some counterbalance tools somewhere for I to get to. Um, but beautiful, beautiful colors in my world. Um, they may be too gray and too earthy for some of you. Let's see. This guy's name is Thomas Wilmer Dewing, D-E-W-I-N-G. Um, I had two pictures by him, but unfortunately deleted one of them. Um, he all, almost always has these elegant, well-dressed ladies, at least his most famous paintings do. He, does, he did a lot of charcoal drawings of um, figures. And uh, he's just a fun example of, you know, just not overtelling anything, not overstating anything. Look at her dress just flowing into the background. Her, you know, they just kind of disappear, reappear. Um, and just enough information. It's very poetic to me with a very romantic tint. I mean, it could, you know, I could definitely see people, it's kind of boring. It's kind of too, too simple. Like there's no information. And these trees are all but just blended out to nothingness. You know, just a couple flowers, 
little tiny bits of edge quality popping here and there. But um, I really do find myself, the more I paint, the more I appreciate this gentleman's work. Um, another painting by uh, Dwight William Tryon, Dwight William Tryon. I seriously don't know if I just spelled his name wrong every time. Maybe did a copy and paste. Um, I really like this painting. He has a whole series of these uh, tall, wispy trees where the light's just passing right through them. And uh, yeah, Can I really you enjoy that, Michael? What's that? Can you enlarge that one? Yes, Thanks. let's enlarge it. Thank you. Yeah, very wispy, lots and lots of lost edges. Um, you know, just a tiny bit of hard darks in it. And that just kind of to say, you know, this is the foreground. This is where you're standing. Your feet are on the ground. You're not floating. And then things get very soft and very airy very quickly. I like to remind myself that um, electricity in people's houses was, you know, either non-existent or very new for a lot of people. So a lot of these paintings were made to be lit, very, you know, almost candle lit. And so they are very, they will show up nicely in a half lit scene. And a lot of times what I do to test my paintings is we have dimmer lights um, in the room connected to my kitchen. So I'll hang those paintings in that area, the ones I'm working on, my, especially if they're on the more tonalist bent. And I will just dim the lights while I'm cooking dinner and just keep glancing over from time to time. And I'll you know, set them really dark to full light. And it's just a way, if they're working in really low light for me, that's just a fun way for me to test that um, they're gonna be successful or at least have a better chance, I should say. Um, this is another um, pretty famous painter. His last name's Wyant, W-Y-A-N-T. Lots of um, paintings by this artist. Um, I just wanted to show you guys some of the design elements here. I love how this curves around and leads back these angles, these angles, these angles. This kind of goes back to our abstracts. You can totally see this painting as an abstracted form. Very little detail just enough that we're like, okay, the grass, trees, little house and sky and some distant hills, but not overly described. There's some grasses in the foreground, some leaves in the foreground, but he really lets the viewer do the work. And one more painting by Dewey. I threw this one in last, um, just kind of grabbed it. This one actually has a lot more of an impressionistic brush style but he does soften his impressionistic work or edges as he gets towards certain edge quality. So there's definitely a number of artists, especially the California impressionists, which we'll be learning about when we get towards impressionism, um, that really have, you can see this amazingly, and my favorite paintings are actually where they overlap between the impressionists and the tonalists. Um, but I wanted to show you that because we will be getting into that. And if you feel like, you know what, I don't want just a big, flat, mushed out, soft edge painting. I, I would like to have a little bit of interest and a little bit of action. You can feel free to throw some more impressionistic, more broken edged uh, brushwork in it if you feel like you'd like to. Um, what I wanted to show you is, let's look at the difference between these two. When you look at this, it's got some nice angles. Angles will imply energy and direction, but it's still a very calm, peaceful painting. Now stick with me and see if I'm right, if you have the same feeling. When I go from this, my heart rate is slow and calm. And when I go to this, even though it's a super serene painting, my heart rate goes up just a little bit. It's got severe angles and it's got these broken energetic brush strokes. You might not feel the same way I do, but I definitely feel paintings in my chest and shoulders. I feel like energy there. I feel, eh, that sounds very woo woo, but uh, um, I definitely can feel paintings in that way. And I like that. And also sometimes I feel like, oh, this painting is not right. I don't know what it is, but I'm feeling it there. But in this instance, it's about the energy. Let's go back and forth one more time. Also the colors maybe a lot more horizontal brush strokes, a lot more big soft uh, areas, very gradual transitions. 
boom, broken brushwork, energetic angles. Um, this one's very quiet and serene and calm compared to most paintings, but compared to other tonalist paintings. Pretty quiet. Uh, this is a, one of Don Bishop's old paintings. Um, when I first met him and saw his work, this is the kind of stuff he was doing. This definitely influenced me. Um, I would have been in art school when I saw this painting, I think. Um, he was a big influence on my work. He and Ramona Youngquist, who I showed you some of her farm painting. She was the uh, lady who had the white houses in her flowery fields last week. They were both big influences. Um, I, I used to go from Pacific Northwest College of Art down to the art museums and they were two artists. I always wanted to see what they were doing and what they were up to and I, I learned a lot by looking at their work and it's neat because now they're my good friends and we paint together and show together. So um, during one of our shows that actually Don, Ramona and I all did together um, I was asked to give the talk at the beginning of it and I told that story and they were very surprised. They didn't actually know that I was busy stealing all their good ideas while I was in college and studying their work and uh, that, you know, then I snuck my way in and became friends with them. So um, the secret's out, but I, I'm not afraid to tell my influences and to share how my work evolved and why it's evolved and I'm such a sucker for every time I go to an art museum or even turn on the internet and see good paintings, I'm just always excited. And I'm always like, ooh, how did they do that? Ooh, I wanna do that. Ooh, I wanna paint that way now. Ooh, I wanna find those colors. Um, so it's dangerous for me, but uh, these guys were early influences, another one of Don's early paintings. And you can definitely see, I think, some of his influence on my work. Um, I love the sky holes. I love trunks poking through. Um, you know, it's definitely not his best work. It doesn't even make sense exactly how the tree is, you know, got these kind of brush strokes on one side and then odd shapes on the other, but it's, it's romantic, it's beautiful, it's very monochromatic, little hints of green blue, but otherwise, if you were to say, what color is this, you would say kind of an ochre orange, maybe, kind of a sepia color. Um, anyways, that's the end of our uh, presentation. With that, we do stop share. And um, yeah, you can see, oh, there you go, some of my tonalist paintings in the back that I've been working on there. Um, kind of a yellow painting that I worked on. I think I posted kind of the quick little stop. Nah. Sorry, my mom's calling now. Um, posted and then yesterday I worked on one down there on the ground behind the camera. Um, that's just kind of purples, pinks. And with both of those, how I started them um, was how I did the demo for the Washington group. Did you guys see the little time-lapse video that I did? Um, if you will stick with me for a second, if you are okay, I'm just gonna pull up my page and do one more screen share. If you guys aren't aware, I do have a art page. Um, it's just Michael Orwick Arts, all one word on Facebook. If you wanna follow me there, you'll see I post uh, a lot more of my stuff. I um, will even just kind of do live feeds while I'm painting, um, some talking, but not too much. And um, I'm just gonna quickly show you a quick time-lapse if you are okay with that. Um, All right, so now you guys see here the canvas. Let me bring this up. This is starting from scratch. And what this is not what I'm really urging you to do today, but with the limited palette, like we're going to be doing for this painting, you can think like I'm thinking in this. I'm just thinking black and white and gray scales. So I'm just thinking values and design. And I'm going to show you two different examples of that. They're only 30 seconds each. So um, and I think I can make it larger even. There we go. No sound. Ready? So I'm just covering the canvas with a neutral gray, getting in kind of a mid gray value. You can kind of see the painting. It's like um, a Polaroid picture just slowly kind of uh, appearing in front of you, hopefully. Now I'm bringing in my lights to carve out some shapes, bringing in the lights there. Is that oil paint or gesso? 
that's uh, actually the black and white acrylic paint. Acrylic paint? Yeah, which is new for me. Um, when I did that demo for the, now it's gonna be the me adding color to it. When I did the demo for that Washington group, I didn't have time to do a dry underpainting. So I just grabbed my black and white. And normally I was doing black and white gesso, but I actually found that with the acrylic paints, black and white, I um, enjoy the fact that it's not sucking it up as much. The colors are, I have a little longer. And I do cover every square inch of that canvas with the acrylic paint. Um, in my studying since then, there is a, I may need to be a little more um, patient and let the acrylics dry longer um, because they, they, they dry quickly to the touch, but they don't fully cure for a little while. So I may be um, being a little risky, but I really like this one. I had such a, so much fun just adding values, adding values, looking around. I'm, you see I'm using the big shop brush the entire time. And I don't think I ever pick up a little brush and just the, the super soft edges of it. Oh, that was that. Um, Michael, did you uh, glaze that with oil or acrylic? I uh, glazed it with oil. Thank you for asking. Um, so yeah, I did it in acrylic. Just as my underpainting, um, trying to get to the third, fourth one. How do I get out of here? Okay, scroll down. This is the one I wanted to show you. Start that over real quick. So there you have my black and white. I just took yellow, lemon yellow over, the, or Indian yellow, sorry, over the whole thing. And then I took quinacridone red over that in just certain areas. Then I blended it in. The Indian yellow over the black appears to start to appear green, especially once they start wiping away. Now I'm revealing the um, a lot more of the light, letting it come through. And it looks like a tonalist painting. Ta-da. <laughs> Sorry, so fast. Um, anyways, those were pretty fun. And then what I'm doing now is you can see with the yellow one behind me, as I'm now adding and building that up, um, I can grab it real quick. And I so what I did was I used that as a base to now, sorry about the glare, start building up paint. So I'm bringing in flowers and detail and reference uh, information. I also went in, it's gonna be really hard to see with the glare, but I lit up the area where the sun is going to be and the reflection. And then after that dries with oils, which will be, you know, probably not until next week, um, I will go in and glaze in a little more color as well. We're still seeing the, the videos. Oh yeah, boy, that was not, sorry about that. It wasn't showing up very well on this. So let me get back to stop screen share. Boom. Thank you for letting me know. Um, how about when we get over to the palette, I will show you over there, see if it shows up better on that camera. Let's take a five or 10 minute break. What time is it? 10.30, let's take a, let's just take a five minute break and I will get over to the easel with my reference and uh, we will get working. Any questions at all before I let you guys go about um, all the different things we just talked about? Sorry, Gail, can't hear you. Oh, yelling won't help. <laughs> about a million questions, Michael. <laughs> all right, well, if you would rather, we, we can just, while I'm painting, we let you, um, feel free to talk to me while I'm painting and uh, I'll see if I can't answer at least 990,000 of your million questions. Um, we have two more hours, so I think we can get through them. Great, all right, five minute break. Grow, freshen up your coffee. I went and got coffee, completely forgot about it. Go warm it up and we'll get to the easel. All right, everybody.
Okay, is everybody seeing the easel? 
Yep. Great. So there you can see the black and white painting that I did um, just with the thin glazes. <clears throat> what I did was put red where all the light was and on the periphery of the tree edges and kind of on the edges here. And then I put quinacridone or uh, manganese blue over everything and then French ultramarine blue on the outsides and where I wanted it to feel a little more dense. I then simply took the light, uh, a big soft brush and just kind of softened all that out. And then my paper towels and went back in and pulled out the areas where I really wanted it lighter up in the top of the painting and everywhere else and left a lot of that kind of soft hazy edge quality. I did come back in and add very, very lightly, just a little bit of yellow glaze into this bottom area to make a little bit more warmth to kind of really emphasize why are these leaves really reddish and why is the reflected area a little bit lighter. Um, but I will now, after this dries, come back in and um, add actual paint, oil paint on top. So that's where I'm at in this one is I am now into the part where I'm adding paint. Um, so with the oil paint, like I said, I, um, but didn't show you because I was on the wrong scene, screen, I started bringing in flowers or the tops of some kind of grasses and everything else. It was a very green and yellow, which was very nice and uh, tonalist. And now I'm just slightly pushing that by bringing in some other colors. I've got some purples and blues to um, show kind of what's in light versus what's in shadow. I, and uh, hopefully it's beginning to read. I also added white opaque paint into this area and kind of introduced the idea of a little bit of sun rays kind of coming through the fog. Um, that's always dangerous for me. It can feel really trite, really fast. Maybe this painting's already getting a little overly romantic, but um, after class today, my intention is to come back in and cool down, you know, areas in the trees that aren't being affected by the light as much, maybe a little bluer, cooler, gray, purpley areas back in that, back in here. Um, I'll add more reddish around the halo of the sun. And um, I may differentiate the tops of some of these bushes. So all the, all the trees and all the plants and everything else right now feel almost the same color, a little too close. So what I would probably do is come and begin to differentiate some of those um, a little bit and just decide, you know, what is enough information without too much. I want the viewer to, you know, have to fill in um, definitely a lot of the information, just kind of sh watching the glare. Um, I don't know. What do you think of that kind of working process? It's uh, I have a question for you, Michael. Um, when you're doing your glazes, what medium do you put in the paint? The truth is I'm not adding any medium. Um, if I do, it's just a touch of the, um, I maybe add just a touch of my Galkid gel or Galkid, um, Galkid, the thick one. And then it's mostly just uh, some paint thinner. And because I'm putting the paint in so thin, I was nervous about painting um, oils over acrylics because acrylics have kind of an innate plasticky quality to them compared to oil paints. And I was always worried that um, oil paints wouldn't stick really well to acrylic paints. Um, but in the last two weeks, I've actually been reading papers and um, kind of the, mo you know, the what are archivalists saying and thinking about it. And it is a little bit of a mixed um, bag. Some people are saying that it's not a great idea as far as super archival, but others are saying that um, acrylic paints are actually quite porous. And that's what you need to have the oil paint sticking to them. So my first coat of the oils is very thin, very much just a wash. So it's kind of soaking into that acrylic paint, staining it, if you will. I'm not, and then as I build up, I will be adding more medium, which will add to the kind of glue, if you will, of how the uh, medium, 
how the um, minerals or whatever the color is and how it should build up to it. But if we think about um, the gesso that's on the canvas, that's actually an acrylic paint, um, generally, unless you're using an oil prime, um, which I rarely use because I find it to be too slippery. <coughs> Excuse me. Michael, I'm sorry that I missed your uh, talk about the black and white paintings, and I don't want to take up too much time, but maybe at the end you could show those again. Sure. Yeah, I mean, the basic uh, premise was that I just used black and white, um, and I actually put out an, a gray acrylic paint, and I'm just stealing from my daughter because I don't actually have acrylic paint, um, but she has drawers and drawers full of this stuff, so she'll never miss it. Plus, I'll buy her new ones. Um, she'll never run out of paint in this house. And uh, so I just use those, and it's just a great way for me, just like I was having with you guys, is to break down the elements. So I'm not thinking about color. I'm not thinking about the temperature. And I'm thinking some about edge quality, but mostly what I'm thinking about is my values. And this goes back to our very first design class, values and design. That's the main thing. And with those acrylics, because they dry so quickly, I'm able to just keep modifying it, keep changing my mind, going in and darkening or lightening areas very, very quickly, which can be a little bit more difficult with the oil paint. So if any of you want to attempt that, the one thing I would urge you to do is give your acrylic painting 24 hours at least, ideally three days, to cure. Notice I'm not saying to dry. Okay, so this is something that I've learned in my um, studying of uh, painting acrylics and then oils over the top. And never the other way around, please. It's never oils, then acrylics. You'll have no bond at all. It's like trying to put water on top of oil, literally. Um, so it's acrylics and then you can paint oils on top Keep your acrylics fairly thin. If you paint them really thick in impasto, they won't cure for months. Again, I'm not saying dry. They'll feel dry within a half hour, but they won't cure. They're continuing to evaporate out their moisture for a long time, quite slowly. So once you put in oils, especially if you put thick oils, that's why I'm doing a very thin wash because it's still allowing the moisture to, to come out of it a little bit. Um, and again, this is all experimental on my part. So if you paint your masterpiece and in 10 years it starts to deteriorate, don't come back to me. I'm experimenting. I'm just sharing the experiments that I'm doing and the information that I'm learning. So I often do this where I kind of try something new and I just kind of deep dive into the literature. I'll watch videos, I'll watch talks, I'll go literally to um, people that jobs are to fix and save paintings and see what they're saying. And like I said, there are some painters out there. Um, Robert Gamblin, the creator of Gamblin Paints, is actually one of the people that says he doesn't think that people should paint oils over acrylics very often. Um, he, that's just, he thinks that the bond is never going to be as good as with oils over oils. Um, but it sure is a lot of fun. It allows me to do my education and my thinking of the painting in a broken, pro a pro a broken process, which again, I call chunking, where, okay, now I'm focusing on this, values and design, values and design, values and design. Okay, I've got my design in, I've got my values established. Now I will begin to play with color, temperature, and edge. Okay, so for me and how my brain works, and we're all different, so you all are gonna find out, you know, how, what works best for you. But for me, I often find when I can do the chunking process and break it into different pieces, building it up from the most important design and composition to uh, values, then to color, 
then to temperature and edges and brush quality, that that's how my painting and my, how it sinks in works the best for me. Again, we're all gonna be different. I just want to explain that. Um, so yeah, so hopefully, hopefully they work and hopefully they're great. Um, but I was thrilled to find out that acrylic paints are quite porous and that oil paints do bond to them. There are a number of oil paintings over the top of acrylics that have lasted for 20, 30 years. Um, and a lot of uh, well-known artists do work in this process. So that's been kind of fun. So just something new I'm playing with, experimenting with. Um, I picked up uh, another gallery outside of Seattle and they want some bigger paintings uh, pretty quickly. So this is allowing me to move forward with that and have fun and hopefully learn while I'm doing it, which is always kind of the best of all worlds. If I can play, paint, experiment, and learn, and hopefully sell it <laughs> so I can keep buying my daughter acrylic paints that I steal, then uh, everybody wins in my book. All right. So that being said, I'm going to do today's painting. Uh, starting with oils and completely in oils. Um, so, but I'm still going to use a lot of those same concepts. I'm going to start by looking to my design and my values kind of first. All right. Um, there's a lot of different ways I could build this up. I've got my reference all the way back here. Um, so what I'm going to kind of do is look at that and kind of decide, you know, what is the big colors? Um, if, if you were to describe that painting in a single color, like somebody hadn't seen it and you were describing it really quickly to them, what color would you say this painting is? Mauve. Mauve? Yeah, I would say so too. It's got a little hints of green down here and some other colors, of course, but I would say it's kind of a purpley, mauve color. So I think I may start the painting with purple, which is probably not even close to how I started that painting. I don't even remember. It was such a fast little scribble of a painting. Truthfully, the colors for, for this painting came from what was left on my palette. I did not reload my painting. It was at the end of the day, or my palette at the end of the day. And I just used kind of a beautiful, these are examples over here of colors that were left on my palette. When I clean up my palette, I will generally put like colors together. So like my orange, my reds and yellows, and they were a little bit contaminated. So I got this kind of nice bricky orange color. Um, another one of my piles ended up being kind of a greeny yellow ochre. I've got kind of a yellowy, almost peachy color. Um, I think this is just kind of a slightly dirty yellow and I've got a very transparent kind of reddish green here. I just save those, you know, they might be useful, they might not. Um, but a lot of times, kind of those colors as you're cleaning your palette, I know most people will just kind of scrape down, you know, imagine this thing's all messy. I've got all the paints left over from the day's painting. A lot of people will just kind of go and scrape and then they, if they want to save it, they'll just turn it into one big pile and it turns into some kind of random gray. Um, and that's how I did it for years and years. But a couple of years ago, I started saying, oh, well, let's just save all the blues and, you know, kind of similar colors into a pile. And that becomes kind of a grayish blue, my greens into a greenish. And a lot of times they end up with such pretty colors that with a little bit of tweaking, they're completely useful. And you get these really interesting kind of grayed down colors that you might not normally think of. So um, a lot of times that's just kind of fun. And I will save those um, for the next painting. So this is my normal palette. I've got my titanium white. I've got my cool greenish yellow, which in this instance, I believe is um, uh, Hansa yellow light. I've got Indian yellow as my orange yellow for today's painting. Instead of a cadmium yellow medium, I've got Indian yellow. I've got a, I think that today I've got uh, when, uh, cobalt red medium, which is quite warm, leans towards orange. I can bring that over a little closer to the camera so we can see them a little oh, bit. Did you say cobalt red? 
No, I may have, but I did not mean to. I meant to say cadmium. Cadmium red medium. And this one I'm a little bit nervous about. It might be a little bit getting a little bit dry and sticky. I can see some chunks in there. I should. Um, my quinacridone red, I pulled all these colors out of the freezer this morning. Um, again, I save all my colors uh, at the end of the day in one of these big Tupperwares. You can see how messy it gets. And uh, just pulled it out of the freezer and put it up. Uh, my French ultramarine blue and manganese blue. For today's painting, I wasn't sure what I'd be painting. So I went ahead and added a tra transparent earth red, which is how I do a lot of my underpaintings. But again, I think today I will be using a purple as my underpainting color. And then there just happened to be some black left over. So I went ahead and put it on there, which is kind of a shortcut to darken some colors. If you want to use black um, as your color, totally great um, for this because it's more about values. Remember, we're, I'm looking at values, design, and soft edges is kind of what we're looking for for today's painting. Um, whichever colors. Oh, and then let's talk about. This kind of all harks back to the last class that we had, which was um, this is where we did these color wheels in the last class. This is um, using one primary, so French ultramarine, um, lemon yellow, and cad red medium. This one's using the palette that I just showed you up here. So two yellows, two reds, two blues, one that leads towards green of the yellows, one blue that leads towards green. So up here, these two guys wouldn't create these greens. One yellow that leads towards orange, one red that leads towards orange, one red that leads towards purple, one blue that leads towards purple, and there's the blue that leads towards green. Then this palette down below, which would be a wonderful palette for today's assignment, is called the Zorn palette. And again, you would use white with all of these. The Zorn palette is a um, yellow ochre, uh, cad red medium, and a black of some sort. You can decide. I think I used ivory black. I can't remember. But the black will actually make kind of greenish colors when you mix it with yellow. But this could be a really interesting one if you're just wanting to play, have fun. Um, Zorn was the uh, artist that was on the first email that he sent out with the girls sitting on the floor that was all done in reds. This is the palette he would have done that painting with. And then this color palette is a CMYK palette, just like your computer would use. It's um, cyan, magenta, yellow, and then uh, I would use black would be the K. Um, but that's just experimenting with that palette a little bit. Um, the black line that you can see underneath some of these areas is just a permanent marker. And I do that just to show um, that some colors are more transparent than others. So you can see it where you get up to the cadmium colors up here. It's a little more opaque, it covers it up, but then very quickly it becomes thin. The magenta color that I used, uh, not the magenta. Anyways, the bluish green color, um, tra more transparent. So with today's assignment, what you know, you can use a very simple, just three colors of any color, like maybe use black instead of blue. That's always a fun experiment. Um, or what you can do is you could, uh, let's see if I can find two pieces of paper, is when I think of monochromatic, what I would do is I would take away part of the palette a little bit and say, if it was like the first painting of the girls on the ground that uh, we saw by Zorn, is a lot of the palette was kind of more in this area. It had some of this, but most of the painting is dealing with these colors. You know, and you can just go around your palette and just say, okay, oops, sorry, blocking it there. You know, what if I did it in that? Blues, greens, yellows, you know, taking away the red primarily or whatever you want. Um, so for today's painting, 
I'm saying that it has more purple and stuff. It's kind of in this area. If I'm looking at the kind of reds and blues, maybe it doesn't even har hardly have any of the warm, warm red, but it does have little hints of yellow and things, but mostly the painting is dealing with the colors in here. Of course, lightening and darkening them. Does that make sense? Use when I say kind of a limited palette. You're free. More, more analogous. More yes. Analogous thank, you. thank you. Yeah, there's the right terminology. Um, analogous colors. But of course, you can use a crossed and you can, you know, do whatever you want. Michael, I have a real quick question. I was really curious and couldn't find it back in, in last week's video. What is the, the black that you like to mix if you're not using a black out of a tube? You said there was a really beautiful one and I can't remember. Sure, my, my first black that I did, well, my first color palette that I did was just like I said on here, um, the first color palette that I used when I started really getting serious about learning. And so basically for me, learning means simplify, simplifying and then learning that and before I move on. So my first palette that I allowed myself to use was these three colors, French ultramarine, cadmium red and lemon yellow. And so, and that's still oftentimes the palette when I, you know, want to go plain air paint or that's just my most basic, simple palette. I know I won't be able to mix really, really bright purples and really, really bright greens, but it's okay because I'll have this beautiful harmony in my painting. So anyways, I would take uh, probably it's about two thirds French ultramarine, a, not quite a third of the cadmium red. When I mix that, it gets the most hideous dark purple. Right? Keep grabbing this color wheel, very useful today. All right, so I've now mixed what would be this color, maybe a little more over here on my palette, right? So now to neutralize this ugly purple, I'm going to add just a touch of yellow and that will bring this color from outside the color wheel into the color wheel a little bit. It just kind of goes towards this color, just a touch, a little bit of yellow, not very much because if I add very much yellow, it has a value and will lighten it. So I'm using it just almost like a spice just to neutralize it, add a little bit of that yellow in. I can tell that it's still leaning towards the red, so I'm gonna grab a little more blue. And I get a very beautiful, I don't know, maybe it's a very hideous, I get a very dark value anyways. So it's just those three colors. That was the black that I used for years. Um, for one year, I made myself only paint with titanium white, lemon yellow, quinacridone red medium, and French ultramarine. Um, I very much strongly, advise it if anybody's willing to uh, kind of, it's, it's a tough one because a lot of the colors that you want to make aren't there, but you figure out ways to make them appear like they're there um, by what they're next to. Um, so anyways, that's a really great one. And the cool thing is if I need warmer darks, you know, I can just add more red to it. It's easy to um, bend it. You know, maybe my shadows are cooler, more blue. They can even go more yellow. Um, I get a lot of variation in those colors and in those darks. So that was my first black. The black that I use the most and my simplest shortcut is French ultramarine. And I almost grabbed the black um, and uh, earth red. It's just a really simple, really quick, dark, lovely, lovely color. And I'm actually thinking, oh, okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tint this painting purpley and do some of my design, but then I'm gonna come back with these two colors 
and get my darks in. What And the same thing with this, it's really nice because I can make a, a dark warm red very easily by adding more earth red or a cool blue red or a cool blue dark by adding more French ultramarine. So I like it a lot. It's, um, I'm still even contemplating doing that as my underpainting. The only problem is it's going to be a little bit muddier, but that's okay because this is a tonalist painting. So I might not get some of these crisp, clear paint, these colors today, but because we're doing tonalism, are you guys okay if I just do my painting to start with, with earth red and French ultramarine? Sure. Sure. Yes. Let's play. Nothing like changing your idea mid-class. Fantastic. Do as I say, not as I do. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, I said I was going to do purple, but instead I'm going to change this to more of an earthy color scheme. And we'll see if we can't get some of those colors back. But it may be that I have to let it dry and then we'll come in and paint it maybe next week. So I'm adding just a touch of paint thinner onto my, you can see it's getting shiny there. Just a little bit. I just don't want very much. I'm going to grab some of this earth red and I'm just going to mush it in there. And I'm going to mix that up. I believe that I'm using a fast mat. I didn't think it was. Huh. Um, but I can feel the kind of sandiness that the fast mat paintings have. Um, they can be very sticky and very, it's called a short stroke where you'll be painting with it and all of a sudden the color just stops even though your brush keeps going. There's uh, some oil paints have short strokes and some have long strokes to them. Um, so I'm gonna try to make it a little more long stroke by adding some paint thinner to it. And I'm just gonna simply do a little wash on my canvas. You can see I've got quite a bit of paint thinner. Wow, that's really warm on the monitor. A little browner than it appears on the monitor. Just wiping off my excess paint. So this would be toning my canvas really quickly with oil paints. Now I'm just going to take a paper towel and I'll just push it around that way. And what I'm also doing is I'm picking up most of that. I don't want a really slick surface, right? So if I left it really drippy and with a lot of paint thinner on there, it just becomes really hard, really slippery, hard to work on. So by simply wiping it back with my paper towel, my paper towel is going to soak up most of the paint thinner. And I'm also just kind of evening it out. So basically what I'm doing at this point is I'm just kind of staining staining my canvas. You can do this with any of the transparent colors really, but this is harking back to my early days when I was out plein air painting French ultramarine and um, earth red and titanium white really for almost an entire summer were the colors I painted with. Sometimes I would uh, get some um, Indian yellow involved in the mix. All right, so there you go. Nice little tinted canvas. Um, just gonna mix up some nice darks and get my big shapes on there. So French ultramarine. So I've mixed my French ultramarine and my earth red. They're both semi-transparent colors or both fairly transparent colors. Um, I've got this whole nice pile over here I can use too. It's even darker, more blue in it. And now I'm just going to give myself my, my design basically looking for my big shapes. 
I've got this nice reference. I like the trees in here and everything else, but I can investigate. I could look and say, you know, it would be better if any of the trees were bigger, smaller, um, anything like that. Go ahead and grab a grab a T-bar here. Figure out how low do I want my horizon line. When when your painting is mostly about your horizon line, there it's uh, pretty important that you get it straight. So I use T squares or whatever those things are called quite a bit. There we go. Nice horizon line. Wipe that off. Just wiping off the bar a little bit. You can see I don't always wipe it off. This thing would not be very good for actually measuring distance on anything because I can't even see the numbers anymore. And then I just have a nice little spot that I hang at. I even have one that's 36 inches I have and then I even have another one hidden away that goes all the way up to 48 inches but it's really big and really heavy and I rarely use it but t-bars have been you know worth their price uh, because of how many paintings they've saved because nothing worse than getting a painting that you love and then stepping back and finding out oh my horizon line is off all right, so my big shapes, I've kind of got a, a tree back here. I'm just kind of going to rough them in, right? Ta-da, tree. Kind of goes to some bushes. Got some nice, interesting grouping of trees here. You can worry as much or as little with the shapes and you know the perfection of your trees as you want. I oftentimes will just kind of scribble in a lot of the big shapes um, knowing I can kind of keep refining them as I keep going. Just kind of let my brush kind of bounce around um, using my shop brush. If you uh, want to play with shop brushes, this may be a great opportunity because we're not worrying about edge quality too much. I mean, we are worrying, but we want it to be soft and kind of lost and found. And uh, I find shop brushes really, I already don't like this little tree sticking up here. So simply give it a little wipe down and it's gone. Voila, clear cut. I'm going to bring down my foreground trees, where do I want? I don't, I want to make sure they're not halfway in between here. So I'm going to go a little bit higher with them. Just kind of creating their line where they're going to exist in space. Before I get to that, if I want any trees back here, maybe I'll hint at a couple trees. Michael, if you were working in acrylics, would your process change at all? Well, I mean, I haven't really done color with acrylics too much. Um, I've just basically been doing that black and white, but um, I don't know if you were able to see in those little 30 second sped up videos that I did. Um, no, it's pretty sloppy. It's pretty messy. I'm just, I'm kind of putting things in and fixing them, putting things in and fixing them. Um, the neat thing about with the acrylics is they dry so fast, I could literally just go in and, um, and put in, you know, the next, the right value or refix it by adding white over the top of it so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, with the oils, what I like is they do the opposite. They dry so slowly that I can simply just go, you know what, I, I'm gonna, just gonna, I don't like this tree grouping. It's, you know, I don't know what I was thinking. Um, boom. Would it be important to find a transparent paint for the underwashing in acrylic? Not so much, but what you're going to see is, um, and if I zoom in, look what the transparency is already doing. Focus. Isn't that cool how it's creating like that kind of penumbra around the area where the darks and as it gets thinner, and that's one of the things I really liked about the French ultramarine and uh, the 
the earth red is that the earth red seems to go a little further. It's like the French ultramarine kind of stops when it gets thin um, a little bit more. And uh, yeah, anyways, kind of fun. I mean, isn't that kind of interesting shape? And it's almost yeah. accidental. Like it already has kind of some negative shapes being hinted at in there. Um, zoom back out. But yeah, I, I guess I'm a big believer in letting the paint and the brushes do the work for you. Again, that implied detail is really important in my paintings. I find that there's so much magic in that and not overly describing things and letting the viewers, like I said last week, do some of the work. break up this horizon line a little bit. And it's not like these are done trees. They're just kind of the sketching of some trees. But I already like that. I already think, wow, there's some interesting things going on. Um, you know, and then I made this whole quadrant of the land of the thing a little more boring because it's going to be about these trees here that I'm going to bring in now. Um, so I'm going to try not to get in the way too much, guys. Maybe I'll change the camera angle a little bit. Um, yeah, there we go. Still OK, everybody? I just don't want to be standing in the way of it too much. Um, so what do I got? I've got like a little kind of a skinnier tree. Maybe I'll even start off with some of the top of it a little bit. I want to have a little thicker. Then it's going to get a little thinner and Getting down to the kind of more solid base of it, maybe some more shrubbery down here. Um, let's give it a little, like a little sibling that it's hanging out with here. Maybe this is a family of trees without sounding too much like Bob Ross here, you know, happy little trees. But I do think like that, you know, like how can there be some symbology a little bit? Maybe, you know, may, is this a family maybe with different ages? but related, uh, maybe here's the parents that are taking the kids. I gotta stop, it sounds so stupid what I'm saying. But, you know. But I am always looking for how can my, you know, simple little atmospheric tonalist landscape imply possibly a deeper meaning or a little bit of a metaphor or a little bit of a story. And this is just playing. I'm just kind of seeing what the brush wants to do. Yeah, this, um, this um, fast matte earth red is very sticky. It definitely wants to uh, Michael, is that a bristle brush? Yeah, it's just a really cheap 35 cent sh uh, edging brush. From okay. Okay. Yeah, I've got. Yeah, I got the whole family of them here. <laughs> okay. And you can see, they get beat up. Mm -hmm. You know, I could be doing. Maybe I will even do some of this with this guy. This horrible should be thrown in the garbage. Look at that craziness. Right? Nobody in their right mind would paint with that brush, especially not in front of twenty of their best friends. But. but it just wants to make cool marks. Just wants to make organic. Oftentimes I'll use this kind of as my finishing brush to kind of come in and rough up some areas. I don't usually sketch with it too much because, well, because I'm gonna come in and cover most everything I'm doing here. Yeah, 
I'm gonna try and pick up a little more earth red as I get towards the interiors because I'm gonna have some kind of transparency. I think it'll be a little more interesting if, and I gotta look where's kind of the, where the trees come down, it's gonna be thicker, but maybe I have some kind of negative shapes. Maybe I can even take this guy back out. Uh, let's create a little bit of a turn to it here. Maybe it gets, maybe it's kind of leaning this way and leaning that way. How do I get a little bit of a sense of movement in these trees? Right, they're all very straight up and down for the most part. Maybe I should have thought of that and given them a little more motion. Maybe that would have been more interesting. Already I'm wanting to like totally, I, I love the shape back here so much. Like I find that much more interesting than anything I just put up here. I'm like, well, maybe I should just make this into a big canopy of trees up here actually. Ah. I just love kind of painting halfway from my head and just kind of seeing what happens a little bit. It's not, you know, a lot of the stuff you see of my work in the galleries or in the finished off stuff isn't this, but you know what, if I'm just having fun, just trying out some interesting brush work. Yeah, I still want to kind of like canopy it out, make, instead of doing these kind of upright shrubs, these kind of look like, uh, what kind of plant grows like that? Uh, What do they make gin out of? Juniper. Juniper. It has kind of a juniper feel to it to me. This one, I don't know what it feels like. Maybe I can give it a little more shape by bringing that out. There we go. Maybe connecting it a little bit. Is it too late to canopy it out if you want to? Not at all. Nothing's too late. Oh, OK. The great thing about oil paints is, again, I can just I can wipe it all back. I can just take my paper towel and wipe this all back a little bit of paint thinner and I'm right back to the beginning with a slightly stained canvas, which is nice. Um, shall we try canopying it out, making it a big tree instead? So I just got to kind of imagine it. So where would it be kind of, I'm just going to Quickly, you guys down for me experimenting like this, changing my mind, you're not gonna yes. think, oh, what the heck was he doing? This class was a nightmare. What kind of crazy person are we working with? Well, you yeah. already know what kind of crazy person you're working with, but. If you can't do it, nobody can. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, let's, I'm gonna kind of use this shape. I kind of like it, but it's gonna be kind of the inverse. So it's, and I wanna save that. So I'm gonna kind of, let's imagine and I kind of like some of what's going on here. Maybe I, so what would be the top of it? Let's say that this is kind of the high point here, kind of the high point here, right? So it's gonna be a much, much more foreground information. Um, do you guys give me two seconds to look through my references really quick and see if I find something that might, I'm even looking through the other references here, the other photos, looking for a shape. So I just grabbed this and this, and I'm not really seeing too much. So one more minute, and I should have a big pile of references. Ugh. When in doubt, pull out the suitcase, right? This is just chock-a-block full of all the printouts and everything. And sometimes it's actually organized into oceans and different things, but you can see, ta-da. If you've been in any of my classes or in person, I often will bring this in. Um, and I can just quickly thumb through it. Ta-da! <laughs> right? Now I'll grab that because those have some kind of interesting canopy shapes. Ooh, or maybe I get really crazy and I look to the coastal trees with their interesting shapes. I don't know. Got a black and white of that one. Maybe that would be helpful. 
Here's the reference that I started using for the flower painting that I showed you, the yellow one. So in here, I've got all sorts of stuff, you know, I've got sunsets, I've got moonrise, you know, lots of these are photos I took or my family took, um, all sorts of stuff. Backlit cows, backlit sheep. Ooh. Maybe. Sorry to waste your time right here. Talk amongst yourselves. Got these trees back here that kind of have interesting shapes. All right, one more quick swipe through. I'm just if not, I will make it up and hope for the best. What are you looking forward to for the spring unveiling this weekend? Um, well, I, I uh, will get to hang out with my good buddy, Anton Pavlenko. He and I will be sharing an apartment. Um, and so that'll be fun. I haven't got to paint with him in a while. Uh, it's always fun to paint with him. So we'll try to do some plain air if the weather permits while we're out there. And then I also invited him to be my painting buddy on Sunday. So he and I will hang out out in front of the gallery during the show and maybe even doing some dueling easels where we trade paintings back and forth just for fun. Um, I'm looking forward to hopefully selling a bunch of them. Um, it's maybe a little optimistic, but I've sold four already. So that's, it's boding well, it's had off to a good start. Um, and I actually could have sold a couple more yesterday, but the people are coming back during the weekend to meet with me. So hopefully I don't scare them out of buying paintings. So there's some interesting shapes. Look at that atmosphere, right? Whoa, I think that's out at Sawi Island. Um, but I want more of the canopy, but I can look to those still and look to the tops of them. Um, and see. Here's a beautiful old painting that this one actually really influenced me back in college. I've had this torn out of some calendar. Um, I don't know what year this was. Just trying to see how long have I held on to this one little reference. Um, but I really appreciated the background trees in that. And I think this, this one little painting really influenced a lot of my work. It's funny how, you know, Things like that happen. You're just like, how did that artist do that? Oh, so close, you guys. All right, well, I grabbed out like six pictures. None of them are exactly what I want, but I will just reference those and see if by combining them, we can get, so I grabbed this one, which again, doesn't quite have the canopy, but it does have an interesting shape and some negative shapes. Unfortunately, it's right along the edge of the paint or the photo. Um, this is just a collage I did with my computer. Um, so there's some interesting shapes in there. Maybe I'll be able to use that. And then all the rest of them, I think I showed you. So limiting that down to three, so my I have a works area, and let's get back into some paint. All right, thank you guys. Sorry about that. Let's see. I'm gonna go ahead and grab mostly earth red at this point because it's gonna be a lot of kind of experimenting. So I'm thinking that this is a canopy shape, kind of kind of comes down into here, and this is also kind of a canopy shape. Maybe I'll change some angle here, but I do want to preserve this tree down here. It's so nice. Kind of maybe shooting myself in the foot by trying to uh, save things this early on in the painting process. So you kind of begin to see hopefully the top of 
an idea. No, and it doesn't have to be equally thick everywhere. So these lines are just kind of, I'm just kind of testing to see what would happen if this was solid here, this was solid here. Maybe it gets a little more hollow in here. And this guy kind of brings it back. Kind of beginning to see a little bit of a shape there. And I'll probably throw in a couple more little trunks in there as I go. I'm going to get back away from the crazy torn up brushes because it's not allowing me to put enough paint down. Get back to a fuller one. And everybody cross your fingers and hope for the best. Here we go. Shooting from the proverbial hip. <laughs> it's so fun when it's a little bit scary and it's so scary <laughs> so i guess it's so fun uh man just looking for some big shapes Are you guys interested in a little uh, self-promotion here while I'm painting? I'll show you Absolutely. guys. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, my show out at the coast. Um, very excited for that. I did some of, I think, a couple of my best paintings to date. So if anybody is looking for a good excuse to get out of Portland to go celebrate their new uh, COVID vaccines, um, get out there and see some art again. Uh, Cannon Beach will be the place to be this weekend. All the galleries will be doing unveilings and uh, and have different things. I think we'll have music and stuff going as well. Um, there'll be quite a lots of different artists out there. And the galleries are going to be practicing, um, you know, distancing. So, you know, they won't be mobbed. So you'll actually get to see the artwork. I know some of the shows, when they have big festivities out there, it can be just almost hard to see where you kind of get stuck in big groups of people, but you know, fun for me, but I understand that it can be tough. Um, but anyways, that won't be the case this year. So good year to get out there. And again, I'm proud of the paintings I put out there. Um, and uh, I'm excited. Um, the other thing is OSA, Oregon Society of Artists, who this class that you're taking right now is through. And um, a center called Manuka out on the gorge, the Oregon side of the gorge. Um, it's right next to the Women's Forum, which is the beautiful view of the Vista House. Um, they have invited me to do a three-day workshop out there. And it's a beautiful retreat area. And it's all meals and room and board are included. Um, looks like it'll be, I think, almost $600, which seems like kind of a lot for three days of study, but you do get room and board included and you're there on premises the whole time. And it'd just be a lot of painting, a lot of fun. The sunsets out there are just beautiful. I'm looking forward to doing a lot of painting um, out there. There's only 10 spots available for that. Um, but when is that? Let me see if I have it written down. It's June 11th, 12th, and 13th. And Yang Zong, uh, Yang Hong Zong, uh, amazing watercolor painter, is teaching a class earlier than that. So if you're into watercolors, um, he is a, a fantastic painter. I'm sure he's a great teacher. I've never taken from him because I don't do watercolors, but I sure should. Um, so those are two things uh, coming up. And then the other things I wanted to mention are kind of fun. Um, 
every couple of years I self-publish because I'm not as famous as my mom thinks I am, um, a book of my artwork. So this is the, it's hard to read, the paintings of Mike Lorwick. And then my personal motto for my business is explore, create, share. And very cool book, because look at that. Folds open, makes a huge scene. Um, and then inside is nothing, because <laughs> I didn't want to write nothing but just big, beautifully reproduced. And it's a lay flat book, so the pictures look great. And anyways, just. Uh, Was there an app you used for that, Michael? I did. I used Peekaboo. Oh, OK. Um, yeah, they do a really nice quality book. I was very impressed. I'm actually going to be putting my business card over there, ad in the back. But um, yeah, so the only writing is just a little bio section in the back. Um, most pages are, it's even got the ocean one in there. Um, and then there are some pages where like these are all little 12 by 12s that I did. Um, some of my travel paintings. Um, I think well, will you be bringing some uh, to sell this weekend? I think I will. I'll call the gallery and double check. They're usually pretty cool about that. Um, and uh, yeah, these books are probably going to be about $25, um, which means I really don't make very much because when you only print up 40 to 60 books, they don't, they're not cheap. Um, but I just use them as kind of a little portfolio. They're fun for me. Um, so I actually make them for myself. Um, as a, This is kind of my portfolio. This is my fourth book I've done. And so it's just nice for me to keep. Um, and then also when I'm interested in a new gallery or let's say a big commission project for like a hospital or something, I give these out as my portfolio. People really like it. It looks nice. They're pretty easy to make if you have good quality photos. Um, and then I just print up a couple extra and basically just try to, you know, pay myself back uh, a little bit of font on the back. And then the other thing I did, and I'm not sure what to do with these, is my 2022 calendar. <laughs> I'm scared. I'm like, what if I lose these? I got eight months to lose these things before anybody cares about them. But uh, I went ahead and made them up early this year because I always make them or always think about making them about a month too late, which is actually what happened this year. So I just made them for next year. Um, but these are also really nice. Uh, just, you know, one big painting on each scene on each day. And uh, it's kind of a lot of replication from the book. But anyways, that was fun. So that was one of the other little project I was working on lately. So I have um, F40 of each of those. If anybody ever is interested, let me know and we can figure out how much they actually cost. I'm thinking $15 on the calendar, and 25 on the book. And uh, we can just figure out how to get them to to you if you're interested in anything like that. But I thought, you know what, some of you guys are definitely good enough and it's a fun way to just kind of have your artwork in a very easy to find. This is a very canopy canopy. Um, easy to find, easy to uh, use and easy to share. And maybe your family would like to see them. So fun way to do a little portfolio. It used to be like, right, everybody had their art portfolios or design portfolios, and uh, you just slipped them in and out of the thing. But now these books are so easy. There we go. We're starting to get something, aren't we? Starting to be a canopy. Kind of spindly oak trees, I guess. I don't know. I just want to look and I want to make sure that my shapes in between are not getting too uh, repetitive, that things feel organic, but at the same time, maybe they do have a nice design to them. So I'm just kind of breaking up some edges. <clears throat> I can actually, even if I wanted to, I could grab a clean new brush and I'm just going to kind of soften, go ahead and soften some of these edges a little bit while it's still, it's already beginning to tack up because I'm using that fast matte paint. Make sure I get my paint all the way to the edge. Kind of 
softening those background areas. Wow, it's amazing how sticky. I really did not intend to use the fast mat paint, but I think that tube is old enough that the fast mat, the part that says fast mat on it, uh, disappeared. Or this paint is somehow aged enough that it's very sticky. And now, isn't that cool or warm, I guess? Isn't that neat? The transparent areas where look, I'll come back in and cover it. And those warm, I love it. I love, it still looks like kind of a sky hole, but it's like there's branches and leaves in there that are kind of obscuring the light. If I want to, I can come back in and clean out some of those sky holes, either with a Q-tip, a paper towel or brush or I can just wait a little bit until I start painting in the sky information and I can just kind of bring in some of that to bring in the sky holes. I know one of you guys um, asked me a little bit about sky holes. If you're on the call, let me know what your questions were about the sky holes. If I, I don't remember if I answered it very well. I think that it could use another trunk or something or something kind of in here. It's getting a little. And this is so still, so up and down, so straight. I gotta figure out what can I do to make that more interesting, right? That's just so bam, it doesn't have much character. So. It's a big shape. It's an important shape. It's right near the center of my canvas. What can I do? All right. So the good news is, hopefully, as I paint my nose, um, hopefully I can get in here and manipulate it. Let's try to think what would be a slightly more interesting shape. What if it wasn't straight? What if I'm using my paper towel? I'm just going to What if it had a little bit of a turn to it? Better. What if this guy over here was really thin and kind of came and went and I'm gonna add a little paint. I'm already out of the two colors I was using, so. I have to mix up some more. Right, I can still manipulate these paints for a while. So that's why I really like I love doing I can get in there and I can take away paint using a Q-tip or my paper towel get in some sky holes that may be a little more interesting. Um, let's maybe bring a couple, not too much. I don't want to have too many sky holes. That might be kind of interesting. Too many sky holes will definitely destroy. So they gotta be kind of important. Like that one is not. Um, so this guy is kind of coming up, turning, what should he be doing? Maybe this branch, maybe getting rid of over here a little bit. So Mike, do you have turp on the, on the towel as you're using it? I don't yet, but I sure could if I really needed to get back. Um, okay, so we kind of have that. You know what? This reference that we had, 
doesn't have anything going on in the foreground. And I actually took the foreground way down low, right? Like these trees would be way down, way down here. If we were actually painting in my horizon line, it would probably be about here. So I've introduced more, more uh, ground area. So this kind of gets, uh, it's too boring to have a big, big flat area, isn't it? Yes, okay, let's fix that. What can we do? This looks like a, one more second, I'm gonna squeeze out a little more of this rock hard earth red paint. Water. Water is a great one. I'm kind of thinking country road. But maybe, let's see. The good news is country road can quickly become water in my world. <laughs> water, where is my water? I am thirsty. Hmm. More coffee it is. All right, I'm gonna add a little paint there. Smash this up a little bit. Now, I'm kind of thinking my focal area now has become in here, right? I've got the most beautiful little tree. I've got some negative shapes. I'm going to have this spindly tree. I've got the nice curve. And so my focal area is basically becoming in here. So I'm going to create some lines that point towards that. You know, just to make it super obvious. I don't want anybody doubting my focal point. Could even just put in rows. Do like farm, you know, country field rows. Michael, I have a question. Please, Elizabeth, what you got? Um, to what degree are you are you dictated by what you think will sell when you're deciding what to put in a painting when you're working it through like this? Well, 100%. No, not really. Like today, I'm having so much fun. Um, but the thing is, a lot of times, like this little reference painting, this little sketch, when I posted this on Facebook, it was one of the most popular things I had posted and on Instagram compared to the other work where I was laboring it and they were big and intentional and thought out and I'd done all these sketches, um, you know? And I think people can tell when you're having fun, and especially if you are having fun and it works. That's, that's kind of the hard part. Um, there we go, I just kind of got a farm going on now. But I want to do country road. I'm just going to use those lines. They'll kind of disappear. But I'm going to kind of use those lines. So what I'm thinking is this road is going to kind of, it's going to go ahead and use a brush. I can control that big shot brush. Kind of flattens out back here. And then it's going to roll. Roll around. Let's see if we can get this. Yeah, that's a good question, Elizabeth. Sorry, I didn't answer it. Um, how, uh, I, I, I wonder that too. It's become so innate in my creation process that I'm thinking about selling and you know surviving, feeding my family keeping my daughter a flush in acrylic paints that I, I probably think about it more than I should, but it's becoming less so. Um, I do paint for myself so much more. I used to sell everything I do, and now I probably don't even try to sell. I mean, lots and lots of my paintings never even see the light of day because I've learned how important play is for just my process. And it's okay to have a lot of paintings that don't 
don't work. So that's kind of nice. Just trying to figure out its proportions, right? And you know, I can make it just dirt. So, you know, maybe it's not a real road. It's just where a tractor's driven four times. And I'm just looking at the perspective. So if this is this wide here, this is kind of the median area of the, it's gonna get a little bigger as it comes towards us. This line's coming a little more towards us. This line's still flaring out. Um, can bring the road in here. So you can kind of see how I do drawing, how I just, how I draw sometimes just using shapes. Like I didn't go through and plan all this out. I just kind of looked for shapes. And that just comes from experimenting and playing. And, you know, you just kind of see what works. And having all these different tools and different ways of building up a painting, they keep it fresh for me. They keep it interesting. And also, I just have a lot of ways to solve all the different issues and problems that I build for myself. Um, I will tell you, though, that like, you know, if, if I'm just experimenting all the time and just playing all the time and I don't finish a lot of paintings then and I don't sell hardly any of them and uh, um, it can it can get messy um, and I have to be kind of aware of that of no you have to finish some stuff no you have to take some of this serious no let's step back let's do the thumbnail sketches let's really plan these out but a lot of times it comes from play first and then you know, gathering these references and everything else. And, you know, an idea slowly develops. What do you guys think about the country road idea? I love it. Cool. Thank you. So now what I'm going to do is bring some darks into my foreground. And then we'll get to color here soon. I promise. What I want you guys to be thinking about while I'm kind of throwing in some messy grasses here is um, where's my light coming from? There's no right answer yet. I have not decided that. We're going to decide it as a team. This is a team painting. But when I sell it, I'm keeping all the money. <laughs> if I sell it. So you see, I'm going to use some of these, but I'm not going to overly emphasize because it wouldn't make sense that the field would be mowed in this weird way. So I'm just using these as kind of guides for myself so I can get some kind of sense of perspective. All right, where is our light going to be? Is it going to be behind me hitting these trees? Is it going to be behind the trees coming out? Is it to the left? Is it to the right? Is it overhead? Don't say overhead. Is it um, from the left? On the left. So we're going to actually have some light hitting our trees. Yeah. Hmm. But I'm seeing the, the, the bright coming through that those back uh, sky holes. And it seems almost like it's coming from there. Yeah, it does right now, but I can show. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's my go-to, right? The backlit, but I say, let's challenge ourselves and let's go from the left. We could go from the back left a little bit so that we get a little more shadow area, but you know, this top area of the trees would be catching more light, this top area. Hmm. It's very dramatic and interesting with the back backlight. 
Yeah, I mean, that's my go-to for sure. I'm almost thinking too, if we went to the right, then I can have these casting shadows across here, um, you know, because you could also use the shadows if it was back behind here, I could have the shadows coming this way, fighting against the road, but that, I don't know. I wouldn't probably want to put the sun back here because then I'd have the shadows following the same lines as my road, which uh -huh. is redundant. Um, if we put the light here kind of area, then I can get, so let's say it's here. I can get some cast shadows from those trees. I can get my cast shadows coming here. Maybe I just change my road a little bit, or maybe my road is just not overly pronounced. Maybe it's just kind of mushed down area a little bit. Hmm. Lots to think about. Hmm, where should our light be? Yeah, I mean, when you do it like in the reference, right, it's already set. It's hitting the clouds basically only in the tops of the trees. So then we don't have to worry about shadows much because the sun's not casting any shadows. It's only hitting the sky. So that can be nice. That's kind of a, I don't want to say a cop out, but it kind of a, a fun way to deal with it. Um, and you get a lot of beautiful colors in the sky because yeah, we still get this neat sky. So how interesting do we want the ground to be? Do we want it to just be a feature, a lead in with a little bit of information and then the sky is interesting and this is our focal area? Because it's more sky than ground, I probably definitely want to think about my sky at least uh, being more interesting than the ground. Otherwise, why wouldn't I just put more ground in? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, again, those are just guidelines. Those aren't rules. Uh, you know, you can have a big boring sky. And that's fine. Or, you know, less interesting sky. That's fine. But as a general idea, when I have much more sky in my painting, I want to make that kind of the focal point. Um, All right, did you guys vote? What are we thinking? Backlit or left lit? Let's just go to those two. Left lit. Left lit. I got one. Left lit. lit. Two, three. <laughs> I want to see you do something different. Yeah. yeah. I, I want you to have fun and be challenged. So left lit. Left lit. Okay. Left lit. All right, left lit. Let's challenge and make this already scary thing scarier for Mike. Good idea. In for a penny, right? Okay, gang, I'm going to take a little break and I'm going to sit back and I'm going to look at this. Um, and I appreciate all your input and we are going left lit and we're going to start putting in color. This painting for the next five minutes or so, 10 minutes, will start to set up. What time is it? Holy cow, it's already almost noon. Um, Maybe I won't do color because then I can do that next week. And you guys, um, do you think, are you guys understanding? <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't really look like a tonalist painting, it kind of is. Um, I guess I'm not doing much color, right? It's a tonalist painting, so I can keep it pretty monochromatic and we can have fun and paint. Hmm. All right, break, <laughs> let me think. Awesome. You guys are awesome. Thank you for playing along. Thank you for letting me be scared and have a good time in front of you. And uh, I, I look forward to seeing you in five minutes when I've had a chance to grab some water and uh, contemplate <laughs> what's going on. All right.
Michael? Yeah. I'm sort of torn because I really was so fascinated with the tonalist painting. So with this option, you're really not able to demonstrate that. So does that mean we won't be doing a tonalist painting? You know what? I'm going to bring it back. It's going to be a tonalist painting. OK. Yeah, I'm just I mean, going to I... do as much damage to this. I mean, make this as nice as I can in the next 35 minutes. Yeah. Maybe we'll go a little bit long for those that want to hang out. Um, yeah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix up some values and close colors. And I'm going to kind of ignore my initial reference, which happens all the time with me, right? I started with this and look where we are now. And yeah. I'm just gonna basically put this away because for one, we're changing our light to be in the opposite direction. Yeah. I'll put this away so it's not in my head anymore. And we are gonna, we're gonna have fun and we'll see. It's gonna be a tonalist painting. Okay. Cool. Thank you for asking. So what I'm doing is just looking at it. I'm just sitting as far away from it as I can get and just imagining different, different scenarios.
All right, so I'm just gonna clean up my work area a little bit. Pull the paint out of these brushes. Got my darks, I've got my design. I know people are still on break here, but I want to attack it. I'm gonna, I don't know if it'll be a finished painting, but it's gonna be a covered painting. I'm gonna cover every inch of this. Class gets what class wants, because this is your guys' class, and I'm already scared, so why not just keep attacking it, keep having a good time? So a lot of times while I'm contemplating things, I'll use that time to kind of clean up some of my brushes a little bit, clean up some of my palette knives, make some area to mix some colors, some values in this case, right? It's more about values. I've got my beautiful Indian yellow for light. I can zoom all this over a little closer to you guys so you can see it. And I'm thinking that this is gonna be a very earthy painting. Yellow ochre, kind of a muted green, um, some grays. So I'll kind of, let's just mix up a mother color, right? Kind of a color that's going to be highly influential throughout this painting. So I'm just mixing some yellow ochre <clears throat> into my earth red. It makes a warmer, kind of a brick, warm brick red, orange. Not very much paint for trying to cover this whole thing, but maybe if it's just kind of my base color and take this and mix it with a lot of lighter color. What are you thinking about the sky with it being tonalist? I'm gonna keep it towards a gray brown. So let's see what happens. So I'm just mixing my earth red into the white with some yellow mixed in. I've got, again, I'm just kind of grabbing from my, so a little more yellow. Let's think, my lightest color is probably gonna exist kind of along this plane. I can bring it again. I'm gonna put my sun pretty low so it's streaking across here, but I'm gonna have it off to the side so we don't actually see the sun in the painting. It's going to be affecting that. So my coolest sky colors up here in the upper right hand corner, which you can't see, maybe I can zoom out. We can get a little more. It's as far out as it wants to let me zoom at this point. So kind of lighter, warmer to cooler in the sky. And then I just had the idea of what if there's more trees over here on the left that we're not seeing? So what I'm thinking I'm gonna do is bring below this line, cast shadow that's coming across from trees. They're just gonna be implied. And that way I'll get a nice horizon. I can have it kind of broken up. And that way we're gonna keep our light on the ground kind of within this area where it's streaking across. So we'll have the shadows on the right side the light coming across, the light coming across, it's gonna hit the left sides of my trees. And I can kind of go in and just to make a note for myself real quickly, I'm just gonna kind of pull off 
a little bit of that paint on the left side. So I'm gonna have kind of the brightest yellowiest band kind of along the bottom coming across, kind of a radiating grid of cool to dark. Does that make sense? My shadow across here, light stooking across, hitting on the left sides. All right, I think that's gonna be fun. What do you guys think? Cool. Ooh, all right. Now I'm just going to kind of decide what's my lightest color. I'm going to probably make that my lightest color. So I can go ahead and if I can find a clean brush, let's just make a note. All right. So my light's coming from the left side across. I'm not using any medium, so the paint's very sticky. So it's gonna be a lot of scrubbing, which I kind of, when I think of um, tonalist paintings, I, I picture a lot of scrubbing going on. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and use my black mixed in with that. So it kind of goes towards gray a little bit, maybe bring in a touch of red in the, immediate, but it's going to stay very harmonious, hopefully. And I just a dab of paint thinner because it's too sticky. Again, I'm using kind of old paints that have been in and out of the freezer a couple times. So I'm getting a little bit of pink in there. Oh, I said I was going to bring in kind of some little trunks in here. So I'm going to bring in a little baby tree, kind of protected in there by its mom and its dad and its siblings over here, giving it a chance. Nice. Maybe this guy has a branch that comes across here. Maybe even one more little baby tree leaning, leaning across, I don't know. Just kind of trying to imagine it. Uh, I think it might get too busy in there. Might change my focal point too much. All right, let's get back to adding color. Now I'm gonna take that down towards a little cooler. A little more gray. Too much paint thinner got all started squirting all over the place there. Got to be careful with the paint thinner because now it's going to start affecting the layer underneath. Maybe too dark. laying in some colors, seeing how they kind of, how I think they might work. Ooh, that's too dark. So instead of trying to scribble that out, I'm just going to wipe it back off so I'm not contaminating that area so much. Messy, messy, but 
what I'm doing is just kind of laying in some colors, seeing how they might play with each other. All right, what I'm gonna do now is just take my big brush and I'm gonna soften those down. And you know, I can bring in more detail and information about what I've done. That brush is too dirty. Um, and a touch of blue for the far side, just to Scrub, 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 scrub. Just a nice, fun way. It's cool because it's letting a little bit of that warmth from the underpainting kind of show through a little bit. I don't know if you can quite see that. I can always add more paint. So, and now I'm just trying to cover it, get a good idea of how these colors playing together. Do they get along, right? I got a happy family of trees. Am I gonna have a happy, harmonious All right, see that? It's already starting to get a little bit of mood, right? A little bit of atmosphere, a little bit of tonalism, if you will. There's areas where I'm pushing harder to scrub, to really push the, the paint and the color, and then other areas where I'm just kind of skimming along, letting my brushes kind of go across the tops. Who here was imagining a bright, happy blue sky? Hopefully nobody, because we've got a colorful gray sky instead. Just kind of go along the edges where the trees meet the sky. I'm going to soften those edges, especially up here in this right corner, right? I don't want a whole lot of attention up there, so that's a good opportunity to use a soft lost edge. And those edges over there too, because also along the edge, I don't want that focus over there. <clears throat> Pushing those trees back there back into the atmosphere, into the fog a little bit. It's gonna allow those other ones to come forward a little bit. Ooh, look at that. Kind of fun. Something's happening. I hope. And again, I can come back into this sky and add all the paint and everything else I want. Right now I'm just testing. 
All right, let's play with my idea of a shadow in the foreground and bring some darks in. I'm gonna take it towards a little bluer, a little cooler, just a touch of paint thinner. Let's too much paint thinner. Let's darken our foreground. Sometimes I feel like I'm still designing, like I don't know if I'm really getting to the painting yet, but I do kind of, it becomes kind of a combination of both. So kind of a foreground shadow, right? Like a tree off to the left side here is casting this shadow. think of our area in here. I'm going to go towards a yellow ochre for our ground. Kind of thinking thinking kind of fallish colors a little bit, keeping it in that harmony with the earth red. So I've got a little bit of a value shift within there from a dark towards a light. I wanna make sure that it's probably not as light as my sky. Maybe I wanna gray that down a touch, we'll see. go ahead and start kind of with the light. I know a lot of times I say dark to light, but I've got my big shapes established and I, I kind of want to see how does this light play? Does it work? So again, my light's breaking across from the left side. So it's hitting my grasses back here. And let it get a little redder as it starts to get towards us, just a touch. All right, 15 minutes left. Can he do it? So you see how I'm kind of flicking it up as it gets in there. It'll kind of make the illusion of grasses over those shadow areas. See, I'm smooshing the brush down. And so I've got both a lot of pressure. I'm rolling it around as I work. I'm gonna let the ground here get a little darker, a little redder. <clears throat> Uh, 
back to some of these grass colors. So I, can, I forgot the middle part. Let's create a little bit of a penumbra effect on this cast shadow in the front, meaning I'm going to create kind of a warm halo transition color. Soften the tops of it. I don't want to dark the darkest part on the top. Maybe it's a little holes popping up in there. grab a brush I can actually control. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to, you see how I just obliterated all the edges in here. Actually, let me soften that even more first. And now I'm going to come back in and describe some of those shapes, hopefully. So I'm going to come back in. Remember a lot of times when I have lost my shapes just by coming back in with darks. So my shadows are getting cast. So this dark line here is the opposite of what it should be. That would be better if the light was coming from the other side. So I'm gonna have to come back in and lighten that shadow. And I want my shadows on this side because the light's coming across the top. Does that make sense? Same thing's going to go for the middle part, which I almost completely wiped away. But the shadows are on the right side of it. So inversely, I'm going to clean this brush and come back in and add some highlight to the opposite side. Let's make some warm, lighter grasses. So I'm going to bring this light across, hopefully. So let's drag the feeling of the light as it's coming across the field. So some detail will reappear. I don't want too much because it's soft edged. A little more red. I'm just bringing back the light as it's traveling across from the left side, hopefully. And this class is getting dangerous. I've had a number of you students all year, and now you're like, ah, I know what he's good at. Let's challenge him. Let's make him do things out of his comfort. And I appreciate that as well as as much as I don't. So the shadow on that side, so let's bring Sorry, I'm getting in the way a little bit there. Let's see if I can work in reverse. Get my hands on this side.
Nope. I'm painting along with you, Michael, and I'm really liking it. Yeah, good. I can't wait to see it. I'm glad to hear that. It's fun. Yeah, it must be weird having me like change my mind all the time. Like, oh, <laughs> now we're doing this. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's very brave and impressive. No kidding, yeah. <laughs> Elizabeth and I have been painting together off and on for <laughs> years now. So Elizabeth is very brave. Well, you and you go really fast as well. <laughs> yeah, that's something I have never mentioned. I keep thinking, oh, I forgot to mention it. Don't paint as fast as me unless you're Elizabeth. Um, paint at whatever pace. Speed is not a virtue in painting. We, uh, yeah, so much of uh, modern painting is this all prima, you know, attack as fast as you can. I'm doing it because I have three hours with you guys. So I just want to get, you know, and I don't expect masterpieces. I hope you don't either from me during this time. Um, and uh, yeah, so painting and I'll have to come back in and fix all these shadows up. I'm just not going to waste time down there right now, but hopefully you can kind of get the idea. I can lighten this up though a little bit on the road. So it's a little more obvious. Um, but yeah, paint at the rate that the painting takes. Don't, you know, don't ever beat yourself up like, oh man, Mike did this in two hours. What's wrong with me? Or, you know, like that. There's no, there's no prizes unless you're in a quick draw event for time. Um, you know, the painting takes as long as the painting takes. And there's a lots and lots of these that I do in class where, you know, I get them to a certain point and then you know, I just, I'll go back in and fix them up or change them or whatever they tell me they need later. But right now I'm just trying to give you some tools to get into your assignment so that you are having that opportunity to experiment and to um, play with the different things that hopefully you're learning during class. Um, wouldn't the big foreground trees have shadows also? These guys? You mean like pushing off to the right side? Yes. Yeah, let's get them some. So it's pretty much right to left. Um, I will come in and pronounce these a little more, but what I want to do is add some nice, warm tops to them. I may have to, you know, after, but I want to get, I think that this might be an important element here. So let's. My light again, coming from right to left. 
So let's make them pretty warm, maybe a little greener than that though. Maybe that's too orange. I'm gonna lighten it up a touch, a little more green. Let's see what that does. And I've got my messy, crazy brush again. I don't know, maybe that's a bad idea, but maybe. Hmm, kind of liked it better a little warmer. Might be getting a little too, too light. And again, I apologize. I'm kind of going to get away. I'm going to move this over so I'm not in the way as much. And let's imagine how's this light coming across? It's hitting the tops. It's hitting the left sides more, right? Correct, I meant, not right. It's getting through there a little bit. Let's give this guy, a little guy down here, some shrub, some leaves. Some of that light sneaking through, making its way across. These guys are gonna get a little trickier. And This tree's barely in front of that one. More of that green now as a transition color as we get in towards the darks. Touch of blue, oops. A little too dark. There we go. Hairs flying off as I do this here. So I've kind of got a transition. I don't know if it's very easy to see, but from kind of the warm going towards a mid, more of a little tiny bit more green, and then getting in towards the darks on the far side. Just kind of trying to think of who Who's catching some light? Who's sitting in the shadow? Letting it get a little darker and a little cooler as I get towards the shadow side even more. So some of that warm underpainting that we had is still going to show up but a lot of it's gonna almost work as like a sparkling effect, kind of coming through. Bring a little more warmth, just some of it's peeking through, getting some of these low guys, kind of cool. Get a little bit of sunlight on them. Nice and soft. This guy needs a little dark in here. Now we need a little bit of light over back here, don't we? Pull back a little bit of color on my left side of those trees now and get some light. Let's 
Starting to look a little bit like a tonalist painting, isn't it? I hope. I'm bring a little bit of red in here just to kind of break it up. see if these trunks can take some light. So I've got a kind of nice orangey color. I'm just going to see if I can't hit these trunks with some light. Just skimming the paint across the top. Zoom in a little bit for you guys, see if you can see it. Focus. Okay, it's too light. I'm gonna make that a darker, but keep it warm. So I'm just gonna go right over the top of it with Slightly darker. Just lightly, lightly skimming my brush across the top. Um, take a dry brush. I'm just going to scrub that edge so that there's a little bit of a transition. Bit of light hitting this guy. Might have to come back in and refine some of these shapes, maybe a little big. This trunk seems like it wants to be rolling. A little bit of light it's making its way through and catching some of these trunks, maybe, as they kind of peek it through the shrubs a little bit, maybe. All right, we are over time again, but I'll keep painting if you guys want to hang out. If not, I totally understand. I think this is a good start of a painting. I think that I will have a good time letting it sit and looking at it throughout the day and coming back and visiting it and seeing where it wants to go. That was a true adventure, you guys. Um, starting in one place and completely going somewhere else with it. Um, and I appreciate you um, challenging me with that. And I hope you guys will challenge yourself on this painting. Um, sometimes fear can be a bit of a guide, which means like, okay, I'm pushing myself. I'm trying something out of my comfort zone. And there's a reward in that and there's a learning in that. You don't wanna go so far out of your comfort zone that, that it's you know uncomprehendable, that you can't catch all the information as it's coming, but just a little bit out of, the, out of your comfort zone, I'm bringing some of that red up so that it kind of has some harmony with those tree trunks that I just added. A good rule of thumb, and it sounds strange to put a number to it, but it is 4% on 
harder. 4% out of your comfort zone is a great area for learning. It's also a great area as far as challenging yourself where you get in the flow. It's hard to get in the flow when you're talking and carrying on a conversation, but getting in the flow when you're painting where you just kind of get lost and become where you're actually having a conversation with the canvas and with the brushes and you're like just seeing what happens. Um, that's a wonderful place to get to. Flow is something I'm constantly chasing. I'm gonna change the angle of the... There we go. Doesn't look quite as washed out at this angle, hopefully. What, what do you think you'll do to it later on? Well, I mean, I don't love the red that I just added in. It's some really thick brushes. Um, because it's a tonalist painting and my whole thing is about lost edges, I may come and obliterate some more edges and really maybe keep maybe just some of these in here crisp. Um, I may add a kind of a blue, purpley gray into this cast shadow and into that shadow, into that shadow, um, which may infect, I don't know if that's a good word, but... Um, permeate other areas. And then there's hardly any paint in this sky right now, but I kind of like what it's doing, but I, maybe I'll get braver and add more paint in there. Um, and then this trunk is just so very black, um, dark that I may come in and that's probably one of the first things I would do is probably take it towards kind of a gray, purple, Again, just kind of like in the sky, um, just to calm it down. I might leave some of the shadow. You know. Anyway, some of that. Um, yeah, I mean, this shape is still really interesting. It's almost too straight, too. What could I do with that? I mean, maybe I can take it out. I don't know. Baby tree. Um, how does the sky become more interesting? Maybe it does need a, a cloud of a different nature in there. I'm, you know, I love my streaks of clouds coming across where those are far away clouds and maybe there's a cloud or two floating closer in. Um, I can come in and add some cooler grays into some of the shadow areas in here too which will create kind of a nice warm versus cool versus just light and dark. But um, really quickly, I'd like one or two of you to tell me what the assignment is for this week for you guys. Anybody? Limited color palette, a lot of soft edges and big shapes. Nailed it. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Um, yeah, what you paint, up to you. Size of your painting, up to you. Colors you choose, up to you. Um, if you want to paint along with what that chaos that we just did there is a team painting, you're more than welcome. If you want to use any of my references, you're welcome. If you would like to just do kind of a master's copy from um, one of the other tonalists, up to you. Um, what we're after is edge quality in this class. I mean, that's focus one. So how do you use soft edges in your painting to create a sense of mood and atmosphere and uh, control the focus of the viewer, right? That's really what we're gonna be learning about with edges is using them to convey distance, perspective and controlling the viewer. All right, I'm going to change my view to gallery view so I can see all your happy smiley faces. Oh, good, only lost half of you. You guys, as always, what a delightful class. I really loved, hey, look at that. Nice job, Susan. Woo. Who else was painting? Elizabeth. I see yours on the Facebook, or you can be able to turn it around. But great job, Susan. Everybody, look at that. It's always one. Oh my gosh, you guys. All well, right. Nice, this one. I'm a good teacher. Ooh. Gail, you just did that? No, it's yours. 
that I own, and I'm so glad I do. <laughs> that is a tonalist painting. Yeah, actually, Gail, could you hold it a little bit further from the? Okay. There you go. Yeah, that is a tonalist painting, if ever. Wow, that's so wonderful. I just love owning it. I love having it in my life. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, anyways, I'm proud of you guys for, uh, well, for listening for so long. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, Susan, uh, Elizabeth. And again, I don't, you don't have to do that by any means. You all get an A plus already, so don't worry about that. Um, and I do think there's a lot to be said for watching once, you know, maybe writing some notes, both of, man, I would never do that. And yeah, that's a great idea. And, uh, and then watching it again um, and painting along and then sharing it, talking about it a little bit. If you can write a little bit of a descriptor of, you know, what you learned, what, you, what you're going to be using in your art going forward a little bit, maybe some concepts. And then I always urge you to, you know, annoy your husband or kids or whatever and tell them what you learned. Sharing it is the next step. And that's how we cement these ideas into our heads. We watch, we listen, we take notes, we do, we share, and we alienate our family. <laughs> that's what it takes to be an artist <laughs> you're a great teacher michael you are a great teacher wow, that was fantastic um, yeah. thank you michael thank you everybody i look forward thank to you so much thank you thank you thank you thank you my dears <laughs> see you at the gallery this weekend yay all right hopefully i'll see a couple of you guys all right. <laughs>